Wow, this is very powerful. I think I should have brought my sunglasses with me. Can you hear me? Good. Thank you for the warm welcome, and thank you for this opportunity to speak to you tonight. Let me see. So, this is going to be a challenge for me. I've only done PowerPoint with a laptop. Now I have to always make sure that I have the right slide. In my lecture this evening, I'm going to focus on the theoretical and methodological aspects of the fertile void, on the implications of Friedlander's theory of creative indifference for the contemporary practice of Gestalt therapy. I'd like to say that I've translated all the quotes from German into English. Since I was asked to present a keynote lecture on this topic, I've been inquiring in non-German speaking circles if anyone is familiar with Salomo Friedlander. And the reactions I got were, huh? Or Solomon who? Or, well, I heard his name, but I've never read anything that he wrote. Is anything available in English? Not much. So I'll try to familiarize you with Friedlander's theory and its impact on Gestalt therapy. When Fritz Perls wrote Ego, Hunger, and Aggression, he stated, for a long period of my own life, I belonged to those who, though interested, could not derive any benefit from the study of academic philosophy and psychology until I came across the writings of Sigmund Freud, who was then still completely outside academic science, and S. Friedlander's philosophy of creative indifference. Pearls had several reasons for finding the psychoanalytic system incomplete and faulty. First, for treating psychological facts as if they existed separately from the organism. Second, for using linear association psychology as the foundation for their four-dimensional system. And third, for neglecting an important phenomenon, differentiation. To correct this third fault, Pearls intended to apply differential thinking, which is based on Friedlander's theory of creative indifference. Before I strain your attention and patience with Friedlander's theory, I'd like to speak about a familiar approach to creative indifference and differential thinking, experimenting. Experimenting allows us as therapists to be learners, to take risks, to be daring, but also humble and clumsy, make mistakes and admit them, and especially to be able to attune ourselves to our patients while still remaining in touch with our own perceptions. From this perspective, an experimental attitude is not only an antidote to narcissism, but it also prevents us from producing premature answers to complex questions. It stops us from knowing it all. To me, this is the basis for working creatively. We take into account the patient's experience as well as the therapist's, and then we explore the situation they create together. This makes the field more complex. The patient and therapist are interacting, each with their own polarities, interests, motivations, experiences, and needs. The patient's polarities don't exist in a vacuum. They aren't the object of an examination, but rather emerge within the context of the therapeutic relationship, within a joint situation. This experimental approach turns the therapeutic situation into the kind of fertile void 
from which the surprising and enriching interplay of polarities can emerge. Novel ways of meaning-making, stimulating awareness, and connecting to one another are supported. This is the light-footed calibration and balance of all aspects of ourselves in relation to one another, being of the field, not digging in our heels in stubborn persistence, in isolation, and prefabricated assertions. Part of the journey toward mutual meaning-making is experimenting with embarrassment. Embarrassment, which Laura Pearls called the boundary state par excellence, in which we have one foot in the familiar and one foot in the unknown, is a fine example of balancing and calibrating polar opposites. It's a little bit the way I feel now, not really being able to see you, being mildly blinded, but still talking and hoping that you're staying with me. If we can stay with our embarrassment, our clumsiness, our awkwardness, then we can make contact with what is different, with the other. And as we allow ourselves to stay with this experience, the boundary of what is accessible expands. If we don't acknowledge our embarrassment, but rather remain within our familiar structures, then we may have the feeling of security, but the price is costly. We won't contact the novel, we won't learn anything new, we won't grow. If patients are struggling with leaving their comfort zones and reluctant to familiarize themselves with the unknown, I will often encourage them to embody their dilemma by standing up and playing around with the boundaries of the carpet in my office, virtually with one, room, one foot on the carpet and one foot on the wooden floor, representing the familiar and the unknown. Standing up, moving around, physically embodying different stances often affords them better awareness of their inflexible polarities and entices them to try out new, more satisfying calibrations. Back to theory and Friedländer. What are exactly creative indifference and differential thinking, polarities, zero point or pre-difference, degrees of differentiation? In a chapter written by the German Gestalt therapist Ludwig Frambach called The Weighty World of Nothingness, Salomo Friedländer's Creative Indifference, uh, that I translated for the book I edited together with Margarita Spanwolalob, Creative License, The Art of Gestalt Therapy. Frambach put forth that Friedlander's basic concepts, creative indifference and polar differentiation, mark the beginnings of Pearl's reflections on therapy theory. Even in his autobiography, in and out the garbage pail, Pearls still embraces the concept of creative indifference. Before I continue, I'd like to give you a brief background on Friedlander's life. He was born in 1871 in Golans, which is now Poland. He was a German Jewish philosopher and satirist. Thank you. I don't know if that's going to slip down. I brought one of my own, so now I have two. Yeah. Mm. With a good measure of black humor, Friedländer wrote very absurd and popular avant-garde poetry and prose under the name Minona, which is the der German term for anonymous, anonym, written backwards. It seems that Minona was Friedlander's alter ego. His dissertation focused on Schopenhauer and Kant. In 1906, he moved to Berlin, where he was very comfortable in expressionist bohemian circles among artists and intellectuals. In 1933, 
He fled from the rising Nazi movement to Paris, where he was very ill for many years, and this ironically prevented him from being deported. He died in Paris in abject poverty in 1946. This is what he looked like. As far as I can, uh, could determine, except for two of his novels, none of his writing has been translated into English. So anything you read in English of his philosophy has been, is in German or another language. In Ego, Hunger, and Aggression, Pearls mentions that there is no such thing as objective science, that all observations, including those made by scientists, are impacted by particular interests, preconceptions, and an attitude, largely unconscious, which proceeds selectively. He emphasizes that human beings are indifferent to and uninterested in what they subjectively experience to be not differentiated. Indifferent here refers to being disinterested, without prejudice or preference, impartial, unbiased. I'm using the term indifferent to mean not differentiated, capable of development in more than one direction. Being disinterested underlines the absence of prejudice or selfish interests, whereas being uninterested refers to aloofness. So disinterested and uninterested are not very good synonyms because uninterested rather means I don't care, I have no interest at all. The zero point, null or naught, is both a beginning and a center, like with positive and negative numbers. Pearls finds that it's natural for human beings to think in opposites. He says, differentiation into opposites is an essential quality of our mentality and of life itself. Our systems revolve around the zero point of normality or health. For example, differentiating into two opposites such as plus and minus, or pleasure and pain. The way we think in opposites is important and depends on the context. Opposites, Pearl says, are more closely related to one another than each is related to other concepts, such as black and white, within the context of color. Differential, differential thinking, which is a term that Pearls coined, is the insight into the working of such systems. We would have no concept for day if we didn't have night as well. Pearl said instead of awareness, sterile indifference would prevail. So in Friedlander's theory, it's important to distinguish between a fertile void and an infertile one. <clears throat> Creative indifference must be distinguished from uninterested detachment, from the I don't care attitude. If we're to perceive and appreciate a phenomenon, it must be different from something else. And as we try to disentangle thoughts into correlative pairs, the unity of polar different differentiation, the middle point or indifference remains elusive. We can't grasp it. Our focus lies rather on the poles than on the indifference. Friedlander says, yet in this indifference lies the real secret, the creative will, the polarizing one itself, which objectively is absolutely nothing. However, without indifference, there would be no world. Indifference, or the naught, zero of the difference is the center of creativity, the original source, the subjective heart of the world, according to Friedlander. 
external and objective is what can be differentiated into polarities, but the internal part is the indifferent, weighty world of nothingness. Originally in German, das Welten schwangere nichts. <coughs> Means literally um, the nothingness that gives birth to worlds. <coughs> Friedländer emphasizes the lively creative center by referring to it with a multitude of terms, ego or ego heliocenter, self, being, subject, individual, identity, person, mind, soul, absoluteness, the symbol for infinity, insistence, will, or freedom. He was very prolific here. And Friedlander's influence on pearls is reflected in the terms that he used in writing Ego, Hunger, and Aggression. Center, zero point, equilibrium, naught, void, pre-difference, poles, balance, and so forth. Friedlander won't be restricted to one term for what is indescribable, and perhaps this joy in circumscribing a definition influenced Pearl's diverse descriptions of the concept of self. Because in Pearl's Hefeline and Goodman, he refers to it as the artist of life, the function of contacting the actual transient present, the system of present contacts and the agent of growth, the complex system of contacts necessary for adjustment in the field to name a few. Friedlander found differ in indifferentiation to be liberating, for it allowed a person to become centered, able to integrate a variety of experiences and contents, to tolerate ambiguity and ambivalence, and to find what he called their heart. By embracing a diversity of possible phenomena, we can actively engage in creative production because creative indifference tends toward creative development. In more simple terms, arising from an indifferent middle point, we can embrace and balance both polar opposites and calibrate our actions De depending on what the situation calls for, the demand characteristics of the situation, Gestalt psychologists would say. Polarities shouldn't be treated as mutually exclusive contradictions, but rather as polarly differentiated units of opposites. They're mutually related and can be flexibly centered according to their zero point. Between the polarities, there's a tension, a kind of magnetism. An appropriate Gestalt therapy example of this is what we call present centeredness. According to Pearls, the present is the ever moving zero point of the opposites past and future. It's not static or absolute, but a constant playing with relativity, a balancing, a back and forth of meaning making. Opposites emerge from the pre-different. Differentiation begins at the zero point, and in choosing a zero point, the field is a pivotal factor. Creative indifference is full of interest, extending towards both sides of the differentiation. It's by no means identical with an absolute zero point, but will always have an aspect of balance, Pearl said. He continued, thus by having the field, the context, we can determine the opposites, and by having the opposites, we can determine the specific field. I'd like to get to the juicy part of my lecture and um, describe a case example briefly. 
As a practical example of implementing creative indifference, I'd like to give you a brief overview of working with a young woman who introduced herself to me as being a quiet borderline patient. A diagnosis given to her years prior by her psychiatrist and one which she researched extensively on the internet. I questioned this diagnosis right away. I asked her to describe what's troubling you right now. What do you experience? How are you suffering? How does it feel to report an old diagnosis to a total stranger like me? Neuroleptics and antidepressants had been prescribed by her psychiatrist, but she more than likely neglected to take them. For years, she practiced self-harm. She cut herself with a razor, and she drank excessively. She was impulsive and chaotic with money. She was shattered after a love affair with a woman ended during her college years. Then she met a man and decided to enter into a relationship with him, a relationship characterized by dependency issues and the fear of being alone. After several years of heterosexual marital life and what she initially described as a sexually exciting phase, she began to withdraw from having sex with her husband. During the first few years of therapy, she gained a considerable amount of weight, refused sex with her husband, supposedly because she was ashamed to show him her body now that she was heavier. I asked her if there could be other ways to understand her withdrawal from him, to tell me how this came about. I suggested that she tell me what it's like to be close and intimate with her husband, and I asked her what had felt so right about the love affair she had as a young adult with another woman. Despite my queries concerning how she takes care of her health, she refused to see her gynecologist for several years. She began to refer to herself as being asexual and without any sexual desire. This was an assertion that I questioned. Don't you desire your husband right now? Or don't you desire anyone at all? Do you have fantasies of being intimate with other people? I'd ask her. I brought up the issue of how she experiences her sensuality, since I didn't experience the way she presents herself as being asexual. I was getting very different vibes. I asked if she knows how to satisfy herself by masturbating, which she claimed never to have practiced, and which at first took her aback. She was nearly 30. Then it got her thinking about this taboo theme. Initially, she was reluctant to discuss this topic with me, since I'm close to her mother's age, and she could never discuss this with her mother. I asked her how she experienced discussing delicate subjects with me, if I do anything to make her feel uncomfortable or ashamed. Then she told me I should always bring these subjects up, but she wants to reflect on them first by herself that my ideas do indeed take seed in her thoughts. And eventually, she brought this topic into our sessions. Whenever I stimulated a different perspective, we refer, we refer to this as putting a bee in her bonnet, as if we would take a little bzzz, put it in her hat, and put it on, and the bee would continue going bzzz around and stimulate her thoughts. I attempted to contextualize how and if she takes care of herself regarding her medication, because her visits to the psychiatrist and intake of prescribed medication were irregular. I'd ask, are you giving your meds a chance to work if you don't take them regularly? How can your psychiatrist help you if she doesn't know how you're reacting to the meds? Slowly, she gained stability at the workplace. She was given more responsibility and a promotion. 
After many years, she gave up cutting herself as a form of self-harm. She got professional advice about a bank loan and overdrawing her bank account. She weaned herself off her meds. Very shyly, she told me that she watched, and these are her words, tasteful lesbian porn when she was home alone, and she was thrilled to have mastered the art of self-satisfaction. Then she brought up the painful memory of the relationship she had with another woman when she was a young adult, and how right this kind of love felt. We gave ourselves a lot of time to explore her confusion about her sexual orientation. Then we focused on the possibility of her being bisexual, not straight. This didn't fit with her self-image of being married to a man whom she at the time claimed to love and couldn't imagine living without. She gradually overcame resistance to discuss this with her husband, who reacted in a measured manner. She lost weight consequentially to the point where I got worried and I wondered whether this was replacing self-harm, uh, cutting as a form of self-harm. But then she stabilized her weight loss. Accompanied by her husband, who agreed to be present while she danced with other women and possibly also experimented with kissing and caressing them, she explored the possibilities of going to lesbian bars. Being able to accept this possibility seemed to stabilize her enormously, and to my surprise, her husband claimed to prefer this new aspect of their relationship to a separation. I cautiously asked her about her fantasies of where these experiments might be taking her in the future, and how this could affect the marriage she claimed was her anchor and main support in life. The patient assured me that she and her husband had established clear rules for these new ventures, and she tried to dispel my concerns. Following these initial forays into ladies' bars, she had spontaneous sexual encounters with her husband, which were satisfying for him, but not for her. I would ask her, and what is this telling you? For months, she claimed that she wanted to have sex with other women, but she refused to be romantically involved with them, only with her husband. She couldn't imagine living with or loving anyone else. I would ask, what would happen if you fell in love with a woman whom you also desire? When she finally did fall in love with another woman, her marriage fell apart very rapidly because both marital partners realized that she was indeed romantically involved. The patient slowly became aware of how she had been desperately holding on to an obsolete image of herself and her husband as being soulmates for life. She moved in with her new partner and is presently trying to divorce her husband in a dignified manner despite conflicts about their financial debts. So concentrating on our work together over years concerning her main issue, sexuality, the dominant and non-dominant polarities emerging over the years from this fertile void were quite diverse. We had the so-called quiet borderline disorder, healthy self-regulating young woman, heterosexual, same-sex orientation. Heterosexual, asexual, asexual, heterosexual, bisexual, heterosexual, same-sex sexuality, heterosexual romantic involvement, involvement and finally, same-sex sexuality and same-sex love, heterosexuality and heterosexual love. Back to our theory. Hmm. Ludwig Frambach also finds evidence for Friedlander's differential thinking in such gestalt concepts as self and middle mode. In Pearl's Heffelaine Goodman, you'll read, 
Self is spontaneous, middle in mode as the ground of action and passion, and engaged with its situation as you, I, and it. The spontaneous is both active and passive, both willing and done to, or better, it is middle in mode, a creative impartiality, a disinterest, not in the sense of being not excited or not creative, for spontaneity is eminently these, but as the unity prior and posterior to activity and passivity containing both. In the English language, there hardly exists any middle mode. It doesn't apply, imply any action on the self, such as retroflection. The middle mode means, rather, that whether the self does or is done to, it refers the process to itself as a totality. It feels it as its own and is engaged in it. So perhaps it in the English expression to address oneself to. The fertile void, which Pearls seems to often use almost interchangeably with creative indifference, also appears in his five-layer model of neurosis. Following the phony and phobic layer, layer, there is an impasse, a kind of blockade, in which former foreground background differentiation dissolves into chaotic disarray. The fourth layer, resembling a vacuum, is referred to as the death layer, also the fertile void or implosion. Here, the indifference of nothingness, the creative ground, can be experienced, affording a person the opportunity to readjust a one-sided identification, to discover unknown aspects of himself or herself, to experiment with calibrations of extremes, and basically recover the middle mode. Then the self can be spontaneous in its agency, integrating previously rejected or undiscovered aspects of the personality, balancing them appropriately with what a person already accepts and identifies with. This is the emergence of the explosion layer. <clears throat> Together with Frambach, the German philosopher Detlef Thiel edited a book on Friedlander and, create, and Gestalt Therapy, subtitled The Principle of Creative Indifference, published in German. Whereas Frambach finds Friedlander essential to Gestalt Therapy theory, Thiel basically disqualifies the method of equilibrium, equilibration, excuse me, and finds Pearl's reception of Friedlander to be superficial and largely incorrect. Since this very informative book is only available in German, I'd like to mention that other contributors to the volume hold perspectives on Friedlander and Gestalt therapy that support Frambach's view. They describe how their contemporary practice of Gestalt therapy embraces Pearl's assimilation of Friedlander's concept. Is working with creative indifference a methodological question, an approach that Gestalt therapists adopt today? It's often the case that people who seek psychotherapeutic help find themselves off balance, out of touch with their emotions, caught in a rut of routine that's limiting and frustrating. And a person who's suffering from an urgent problem will most likely not be ready and willing to immediately begin the search for aspects of their perception that have been avoided, overlooked, devaluated, or which are potentially shameful. They may say, this is who I am, this is how I am, I'll never be able to change. Therefore, a trusting, mutually appreciative therapeutic basis is important before we embark on the adventure of exploring unknown territory. And as usual, we are accompanying our patients, not forcing our insights and interpretations down their throats. We all know that the need to change and grow is often as strong as the need to hold on to our familiar ways of dealing with life. 
Not being aware of things that might shed light on our situation is one way of avoiding a, uh, a decision that could bring about change. So it's our job to keep the dominant pole in awareness while helping the patient to realize that there's a polar opposite out there that's being neglected and the, that these polar opposites are parts of a whole, aspects of the same reality. We can help them to realize that restricting themselves to one pole not only keeps them in an unsatisfying situation, but also robs them of the opportunity um, to test more enjoyable and satisfying ways of being. A part of our task is to stimulate our patient's curiosity and help them complete the picture between the familiar pole and the unknown one, taking the many small steps in between. And this is, involves what I often call rewinding their film. To this effect, an indifferent attitude, an approach of not knowing for sure is helpful. Not knowing for sure implies that there are countless ways of dealing with a problem, not just one. This takes into account the uniqueness of each patient and each therapist and the uniqueness of the way they work together. Moreover, the rest of the field, the current context, must be considered, such as life circumstances, the social, financial, political situation. Friedlander's equilibration of polar opposites certainly influenced Pearl's work with polarities, as well as the Gestalt therapy concept that human beings create their own reality. Equilibrating or centering implies appropriate adjustment to a situation, balancing the predominant with the neglected aspects, transforming a futile struggle into productive cooperation, turning a standoff into enjoyable interplay and enriching recombination. Instead of, if that's my mother, please tell her I'll call her back in about an hour. <laughs> Instead of rigid and isolated dualities, we have flexible and related polar opposites. <clears throat> if the center, self, zero point, or fertile void is indifferent or undifferentiated, and everything possibly human is a priori contained in this, then the fertile void can be considered to be an inexhaustible source of energy and possibilities. Friedlander calls this fertile void insistent, and it only becomes existent through the will of a person. The distance from the zero point of one's decision corresponds to a distance from this same zero point in the direction of what this person is avoiding or not embodying. From this perspective, if one's very essence is considered to be invulnerable, all movements away from this center are seen to be relative differentiations. Then all the decisions one makes, all the undesirable developments, all the injuries and traumata, can be worked through in light of an opposite force that can be accessed. To me, this is a very life-affirming position, and it's vital for our work as Gestalt therapist and appeals to me on the one hand. But on the other hand, I must admit that I sometimes feel restricted and somewhat confused by Friedlander's elusive concepts. In my perspective, a contemporary Gestalt therapeutic concept of the fertile void is not just about concentrating on a patient's polarities and calibrating them, because this reflects the one person psychology of the past. A contemporary perspective is multidimensional and highly relational. I tend to envision a three-dimensional conglomerate of related parts that can be jointly reconfigured many times over. Rather, a sculpture, an installation, or a group of items placed together meaningfully than a drawing, because the parts need to be movable. 
So let's not just limit ourselves to focusing on the calibration of polarities, but also on the additional dimensions of what we as therapists bring into the equation. The relational presence, present of the patient as well, the dimension of time, and many other influences on the present situation. I'd like to mention the work of several Gestalt therapists on whose concepts I've drawn in reflecting on the fertile void. Joseph Zinker on polarities and experiments, Frank Stemmler on cultivated uncertainty, Laura Pearls on meaning making and embarrassment, Richard Wallen on Gestalt theoretical principles, and Jean-Marie Robin on intentionality and the situation. Zinker sketched his notes, notions of a healthy and a pathological self-concept in terms of polar opposites and aware versus unaware experiences. This is a sketch of his of the uh, healthy self-concept where the, um, the aware part is, in, is white and shows the the polarities that are uh, accessible to an individual and the shaded area are his blind spots. So the shaded area is rather small. The pathological self-concept is here. It shows a rather large shaded area of blind spots, things that aren't accessible. It shows um, inflexibility and, and unawareness. Despite the fact that many of us today deal with categories of healthy and pathological, pathological as being on a much more fluid spectrum and rather founded on relationally based aesthetic criteria than individual pathology, Zinker's sketches enable us to understand that embracing contradictions, ambivalence and ambiguity and the ability to experience relationships between these internal aspects help to keep us balanced. Here he shows that if we stretch the polarities in one direction, it automatically stretches also in the other direction. <clears throat> yeah. When Frank Stemmler refers to cultivated uncertainty as an attitude for Gestalt therapists that reflects the dialogical approach, it implies that we must be aware of our uncertainty regarding our own attribution of meanings to patients. Looking closely, we also find it in what Laura Pearls called the three E's of Gestalt therapy. It's existential, experiential, and experimental. According to Laura Pearls, we're constantly creating out of nothingness, psychotherapeutically, artistically, or scientifically, with insights and realizations, with the reconfiguration of chaos and ugliness into something new and meaningful. Following the thoughts of Laura Pearls and Paul Goodman about aesthetic qualities being inherent to human experience, Michael Vincent Miller, in a beautiful article called Notes on Art and Symptoms, reminds us that Gestalt therapy theory reflects concepts we're familiar with in the field of art. Good contact can be seen as an aesthetic activity, and these activities demonstrate good form and are thus beautiful in the sense of being meaningfully organized and integrated. Both art and psychotherapy thus reflect the human tendency to form and transform familiar elements and thus bring about new information to transform one's own experience in a world in a way that allows for integration. By creating something unique and meaningful, form is given to human experience. It's precisely the integration of seemingly incompatible and disparate experiences, the ability to deal with the challenges of ambiguity and complexity, 
the skill of being able to embrace differing perspectives and contradictory alternatives with ease and comfort, that's our goal in therapy, for they afford us meaning and a sense of being one with ourselves in relation to others. Such ongoing Gestalt formation belongs to the essential goals of Gestalt therapy. To Laura Pearls, we human beings are always involved in the polarities of being unique and being mortal. The first gives us the impression of incredible significance, the second, the feeling of fear and frustration. And the human condition is a continuous balancing of the tension between these poles. <coughs> Richard Wallen convincingly tied Gestalt psychological principles, in particular Gestalt destructuring and formation, to the effective practice of Gestalt therapy. He suggested ways of inter intervening that would destabilize a blocked, unsatisfying life situation and support the patient in reconfiguring the field into a meaningful whole. He gave great attention here to bodily awareness and careful experimentation with perception of and movement. Although he doesn't speak in terms of fertile voids or polarities, he does focus on deconstructing an imbalanced field and reassembling it, beginning fresh to allow a meaningful gestalt to emerge. And this brings me to Jean-Marie Robin's profound work on taking shape. In an article published in 2003, Robin focuses his attention on the therapeutic situation and the importance of the un or pre-differentiated phase, the vague, confused, diffuse or chaotic phase of four contact before a figure clearly emerges. He states, what we call the social situation is a structure of possibilities that I create with the other and which in turn creates us respectively. Clearly the therapeutic situation defines my presence and my intention as a psychotherapist just as it defines the presence and expression of my client. The concept of the self in Gestalt therapy tends to focus on someone's I am, a narrative identity, which is one of the possible declensions of the personality mode of the self, a result of experience in a certain situation. Contrary to Gestalt's temporalized and delocalized way of approaching the concept of self, narrative identity tends to be static, perceived as a structure or character. It gives us the impression of fixity, suggesting that the self is something permanent or stable. So this need for stability and continuity forecloses access to the novelty of situations and opens us to the repetition of experiences, including the most painful ones. So if a pa patient has some presuppositions about themselves or us as a therapist, then it prevents this person from sensing in the situation what's really going on. They don't, they aren't of the situation. So um, this might suit their comfort zone and need for security and certainty, but instead of staying in contact with their immediate sensations and perceptions, however vague, confusing, or contradictory, we often tend toward what Robin calls premature differentiation which is based on a similar premature individuation. So Rabin compels us to linger in this phase of four contact or skillfully return to it with our patients. So we can enable them to access novel aspects of our meeting and to avoid these over hasty assertions or premature intentionality. 
because intentionality precedes what forms a person's conscious intent. We can seek it in the therapeutic situation by expressing how we, as another, in the presence of our patient, are emotionally impacted by this encounter, how we resonate and experience it. We begin with experience with what is sensed and perceived in the moment, as opposed to our assumptions of the other. What I sense and intuit when together with someone helps me to understand what's in the field. The way I'm affected by a patient gives me information about their intentionality. And how I act on this can support its differentiation and open the person to new possibilities. Here, now, next tells us that in the present moment, there is an, in, an orientation, an imminent direction, an implied future. Robin talks about the metaphoric construction site, which is reopened by each encounter, giving us novelty surprises and touching the unknown. And it appears to me that it's just this metaphoric construction site, I love that expression, is the rich source of all possibilities, creative indifference. This view has implications for the effective practice of Gestalt therapy. Rabin reminds us to attend more carefully to the phase of the process of construction and deconstruction of Gestalts, the emergence of figures against a background. As he said, at the fertile exit from the void, that, according to Pearls, defines the zero point, the before and after of every gestalt. So instead of taking our patient's presenting problem or the figure they decided to work on at face value, it's our task to introduce a measure of uncertainty or doubt, maybe irritate them a little. Interventions are called for that enhance the vagueness they can help to work back to the id of the situation, to an undifferentiated state from which together we can allow gestalt construction and deconstruction to un unfold. As Rabin says, this complexifies intentionality by amplifying confusion. This is one of the gold nuggets in this article, it's wonderful. So we jointly revisit the elements that contributed to the emerging figure. We disentangle the material, we try to reconnect it, we restructure it through the presence of another in a way that takes our own situational present and our presence into account. We afford the patient different information, adding complexity, and the reorganization Excuse me, but this collaboration on the process of reconstruction allows for novelty and the reorganization of a dysfunctional situation. So this redistributes the excitation. It reorients the direction of meaning. We extend an invitation to play. We play with the situation until work becomes play. Therefore, our interventions are aimed at enabling possibilities. We collectively disconnect, deconstruct, de-autonomize, we reshuffle, and then we reconstruct. We stand by our patients during upheaval and temporary chaos. We contain confusion and seeming incompatibilities. We assist the new configuration of figure and background we maintain mobility and flexibility. Our task is not a, member, a, a matter of substituting dysfunctional connections with new, more appropriate ones, but it's much more a matter, in Rabin's words, of introducing mobility in such a way that nascent experience can modify, excuse me, can modulate its available and accessible materials into creative configurations themselves unceasingly renewed. And this reminds me of an old saying, 
If you give someone a fish, then he has food for one day. But if you teach him how to fish, then he'll have food for a lifetime. Our patients' difficulties in living, their symptoms and suffering can be seen as the production of figures from the available materials in their backgrounds. It's a process of gestaltung, of taking shape, giving form to something. So we're engaged in the structuring of the situation. Often we'll have to interrupt a patient's prepared narrative or insist on rewinding the film so that we can benefit from the possibilities of an undifferentiated starting point and continuously engage in the aesthetic creation of meaningful forms. It's this undifferentiated location, this vague phase of four contact, that I relate to creative indifference. It's the deep well of all possibilities, the metaphoric construction site. So my perspective can be summed up as a decidedly relational, multidimensional approach. Our tasks are to intervene in such a way that the rigid patterns of our patients can be softened, their age-old assumptions are reassessed as to their appropriateness to the current situation. Over-hasty narratives are slowed down and explored step by step. A prefabricated solution to a problem is put on hold and the focus is placed on collaborative meaning making based on aesthetic experiences. <clears throat> Accordingly, the original situation and materials from which these figures emerge can be jointly perceived, experienced, reconnected in a novel way thanks to the sensory experience, immediate emotional reaction, and insights of the therapist within the therapeutic situation. Typical interventions to this effect are, I feel as if you're giving me the answer to a question I haven't posed yet. Let's rewind the film to the beginning and proceed slowly. Tell me more about what you were experiencing before you came to this conclusion. How else could we perceive this situation? What might we have overlooked? Describe your bodily sensations and impulses. Do any images arise? What do you smell or taste? Who or what might have played a role when this difficulty first arose? What's the opposite of your feeling powerless and being at your partner's mercy? My breathing becomes shallow as I listen to you. I feel angry when I hear what you're telling me. I start to feel hypnotized when I listen to you talking without interruption. I feel out of touch with you when you talk about yourself in terms of clinical diagnoses. Clearly, this implies that we're not working solely with a patient's polarities, but also with what emerges as figural from the context of our experiences, with our immediate sensory and emotional reactions, our fantasies, with our reflections on the therapeutic relationship and dynamics. The therapy room has become a multidimensional space for creative play and experiment, for novel compositions, mixtures, and new combinations. We are part of the equation. A creative collaboration of therapy is for the moment real and a game, one which is limited in time, but which has a lasting effect. We have extended an invitation to play. As psychotherapists, we can assume that if people have learned a one-sided view of themselves and others, they can also learn to balance these misperceptions or premature assertions. At times, we're like good parents. We're attentive to their needs. We offer them a safe space to explore what might feel threatening and encourage them to restructure and reconnect 
their interpersonal fields. We encourage them to take stock of their current assumptions and models of the world, to test novel ways of constructing, of construing, excuse me, their situations, and discover what's appropriate to their life here and now with a view to what comes next. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.